Welcome, folks. Good to see you. Welcome to Morning Prayers. Sunday, the 12th of March, 2022. As has become the norm, this is recorded. But I'm not just going through the motions here. This, for me, is an act of worship, and I understand that you will be joining me later. But I'm very much be praying. Through the reading set for today, we have Psalm 27, the triumphant song of confidence. Genesis chapter 15, God's covenant with Abraham. And Luke chapter 13, Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. Our message today comes from Tony Hay. So thanks to Tony for his efforts there. Don't forget to pop your prayers in the comments section as you come together. Our admin will be in the background encouraging you and wherever you're watching, Facebook or YouTube. Once again, great to have you with us. I've been requested that we focus back on the Methodist Way of Life video that gave a lot of encouragement to folks, so that will be included today just after our live stream intro. As disciples, we try to live each day in response to God's love by following Jesus. A Methodist way of life is a way of growing as a Christian by reflecting on our faith journey and living out our faith. It's an encouragement to worship through prayer and looking and listening for God in scripture and the world, caring for our neighbours and God's creation, challenging injustice and sharing our faith with others. A Methodist way of life is for everyone who wants to take up God's invitation to follow Jesus and live in a God-centred way. Don't worry if that feels a bit heavy. This is an encouragement to do the best we can, knowing we might fail sometimes. But we are committed to doing this together and with God's guidance, helping each other grow into the people God wants us to be. A Methodist way of life is like a plant trellis in a garden, a support that guides us as we grow and flourish. So, good morning, folks, and wherever you're watching us, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to this service for the second Sunday in Lent. Things certainly seem to be moving fast, uh, don't they? I'm using some of my prayers from the Holy Communion for Lent and Passion, Passion Tide order of service in the Methodist worship book and we are reminded through Lent uh, that uh, we firstly remember the God of the Old Testament who calls us to be honourable in terms of following and obeying the Ten Commandments so our Lenten services begin with this exhortation but grace and peace uh, to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as we gather 
And we remember the commandments of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said. The first commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should one love one another. Amen. So those are the commandments of the Lord Jesus, the summing up of the law. And as we move forward uh, this morning, we're going to turn to Psalm 27. It's the psalm of confidence, a triumphant song of confidence. So I'm using Oremus Bible Browser, as you can see here. Very helpful uh, resource uh, for us. And uh, Psalm 27 of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an enemy encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord, all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble he will conceal me under the cover of his tent he will set me high upon a rock now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I do seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I'll repeat that last line. I sense that might bring comfort to some of us who are struggling at the moment. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Amen. And as part of our live stream morning worship, uh, we've had a particular uh, video that I found helpful. It's actually rooting our hope in the Old Testament, in the stories of the Old Testament, in those who had faith. And since we've begun looking at the Old Testament and we'll continue, we're going to look at the Genesis reading shortly. I just thought I'd give you this opportunity to look afresh at this video and draw strength and inspiration from it. And then we'll then move on and we'll be listening to uh, Saviour of the World. So, folks, do be encouraged.
pray that you found that helpful. I remember the the words appearing there next to the image, men and women like us, uh, broken and weak, uh, but with faith to believe and have courage. Uh, the stories of old, uh, their stories are our stories, and we are encouraged to have faith uh, again. So, folks, we move on. Remember Jesus as the fulfilment of the uh, Old Testament, as we've just begun when we heard that summing up of the law. Uh, we're going to listen now to Saviour of the World. As it's Lent, there's a, there's a, a clearer focus on, yes, the story of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the journey to Jerusalem. And this song reminds us uh, that Jesus gives his, life for, gives his life for us and uh, for the world. Jesus, Saviour of the world. We're going to turn to our reading from Genesis now. And uh, one of the facets of this story, it's uh, how God uh, reassured Abraham and how Abraham uh, was entered into covenant with the Lord. Uh, one of the things that's reassuring was that it was through an act of worship, an act of obedience and devotion uh, that Abraham 
uh, found his security and his promise. So once again, I'll turn back to Oremus Bible browser. So here we know, here we are, Genesis chapter fifteen, verses one to twelve and seventeen to eighteen. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to them, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Amen. And so, yes, ancient practice, it might be, and gory story, yes, it might sound very much like that. But ultimately, uh, this is an act of worship of Abraham, a Abraham uh, offering and to God his future of God asking Abram's obedience, of him bringing sacrifice uh, to God, offering the best that he could offer. And in that act of worship, Abram receives an assurance. And there is this paradox here, isn't there, of the darkness, uh, the fearful, the darkness that was terrifying being there as a deep sleep fell upon Abram. But yet in the midst of that terrifying darkness, uh, God establishing the covenant with Abraham. To your descendants, I give this land. Amen. I thought it might be helpful for us to follow and to join together in our prayers of confession. We see God's grace, don't we? God's grace despite Abraham's questioning. Let us pray. Lord, you are steadfast in your love and infinite in your mercy. You welcome sinners and invite them to be your guests. We confess our sins, trusting in you to forgive us. And when I say, Lord, have mercy or Christ, have mercy, I invite you to respond. You may wish to say it it aloud to yourself or write it in the comment section or send me some praying hands we have yielded to temptation and sin lord have mercy and let us repeat lord have mercy we've turned from our neighbors in their need christ have mercy christ have mercy we've resisted your word in our hearts lord have mercy lord have mercy May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and keep us in life eternal. Amen. And remember, um, 
one of the collects for today. Christ, Son of the living God, who for a season laid aside the divine glory and learned obedience through suffering, teach us in all our afflictions to raise our eyes to the place of your mercy and to find in you our peace and deliverance. We make our prayer in your name. Amen. And a second prayer for today that you may find helpful about withstanding temptations. Merciful Lord, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For our next song, I thought it might be helpful just to remember the words, the lyrics of Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. You may not be aware, but this was written uh, within the temperance movement. So there is something within this about uh, people finding their ways out of the cloud of intoxication and, and becoming sober before the Lord. And uh, it may not be alcohol that's causing, causing us to, to be existing almost in a cloud and struggling to find direction and purpose. It may be other things in life, uh, but dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways as a, is, is a means by which we are able to open our hearts to God to repent and to hear that reassurance that God can set us back on our feet and we can become the people that God intended us to be. You can become the person that God intended you to be. Amen.
Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Amen. So as you can see, Luke 13, verses 31 to 35, entitled here, The Lament Over Jerusalem. We're just uh, encountering that point in the Gospels where the conflict between Jesus and the authorities uh, becomes obvious. Here now, uh, the Pharisees uh, approach Jesus and, well, the Pharisees have questions about uh, Jesus's ministry and what he has to say w without uh, any you know, any debate. The Pharisees have questions, but they use uh, Herod as a lever to say, oh, look, Herod, you know, who is responsible for overseeing uh, Jerusalem under Rome, Herod wants to kill you. And so there's a veiled threat um, f from, uh, from the Pharisees uh, to Herod, really. And uh, Jesus seems here to be steadfast in his uh, mission and uh, his determination uh, as we shall see. But he laments those who will not repent in Jerusalem and who will not uh, inherit the goodness that God has to offer, God's uh, blessing. And uh, we hear those words now. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. As I've prayed about this passage, as well as having uh, songs of repentance in this season of Lent, um, I also felt it was important to have a song that focused on Revelation. And indeed, we're going to hear Revelation song because you have the two things happening here. You have the good news that Jesus is coming, the promise of the kingdom, which is both here and coming. But of course, good news is difficult for some, is difficult news for others, those who uh, risk losing power and also uh, Jesus' ministry is a revelation of what is to come. And so before we hear from Tony, who will be sharing his reflection with us today, uh, we listen to Revelation Song. <laughs> Bless 
A revelation uh, song. I pray that uh, that inspired you as much as it encouraged me as I sit here and uh, I'm worshipping. And uh, I introduce now Tony Hay, uh, who will be sharing our message for today. I did think it might be appropriate just to pray for Tony and like uh, all of our uh, those who uh, prepare uh, reflections for us. You know, they were preparing earlier in the week. And they do bless us. So let's pray now, wherever Tony is, that Tony feels blessed. So Lord, we thank you for Tony and for his ministry among us and his ministry in his own circuit as well. Uh, we pray that you would uplift him this day and that you'd encourage him as much as he uh, encourages us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you again. Have you noticed that God can be really quite disconcerting at times. Think of the promise referred to in this morning's uh, reading in Genesis. Two or three chapters previously, God had promised to Abraham that he would become the father of a great nation, that he would have countless descendants, more than the grains of sand on the seashore and so forth. And Abraham must have been very excited by this, looking forward to it great expectations. Trouble was, nothing much happened. Blow this business about countless descendants, at this stage there wasn't even one. He had no child at all. Now according to the custom of those days, if a man died childless, or at least without a son, sorry, it was a male-dominated society, that was the fact then, we can't change it. 
if he didn't have a male descendant, then he would be expected to adopt one in order that he had a descendant. And this, if, it was, if there was no suitable family member available, then he'd be expected to adopt a servant from his own household to be his heir. And that's where Eliezer came in. Doesn't sound much of a descendant really, does it? In fact, really, all this business about descendants doesn't seem much of a promise from God at all. Think of some of the problems that we're facing at the moment in our world. How about COVID? How about Ukraine? And incidentally, I should be very careful about what I say concerning Ukraine this morning. I shan't refer to it very much other than the obvious need for prayer. And that's because I'm having to record these, this reflection about 10 days before you will actually hear it. And therefore, things will inevitably have changed hugely in that time. So a God who, well, allows COVID, allows Ukraine. Not much of a God, is he? So why doesn't God zap the virus? Or the Russian army? Or Putin? Well, the thing is, of course, that God doesn't work like that. God is a God of love, not a God of zapping. And then Abraham is told to count the stars. That sounds ridiculous. Please remember that in the thinking of those days, this meant tiny pinpricks of light in the sky. There was no concept of the universe as we now understand it. In those days, God was God of a very much smaller universe. We realise today God is much, much, much bigger than that. And yet, note what God did. I beg your pardon, note what Abraham did. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Point, incidentally, picked up by Paul in his letters to the Romans. Abraham believed, trusted. Believe there is, is, is an active word. It's not a terrible word. It's not just simply saying, oh, you know, I think this is true. It's because this is true, this is how I will react. This is what I will do. He believed the Lord and he counted it, was counted as righteousness. Righteousness is not about earning brownie points. So did God make a promise to Abraham? No, he didn't. He made a covenant with him. And there's a very, very important difference. Promise means that I will do something no matter what. A covenant is an agreement. It's a partnership. For example, if you were to buy a new house, you would make a covenant with the present owner. The covenant being that you would pay the owner an agreed amount of money and the owner would then transfer the title deed to the property to you. A covenant is a two-way partnership. There are many covenants in the Old Testament and of course one very big one, the New Covenant, the New Testament, testamentum incidentally is a Latin word which means covenant, um, in, in the New Testament made by Christ on the cross. Notice the ceremonial that was attached to it. When we read all this business about the animals and what they did, it all sounds really rather weird and wonderful, a bit sort of mumbo-jumbo-ish, really. The older I get, the more I realise the difficulty of translating the Bible. 
Translating the words is bad enough because words always have overtones in one language which don't exist in another one or into the language into which you're translating. You may use words which have overtones which were not there in the original. But I am increasingly convinced that the far bigger difficulty is not translating the words, it's translating the culture. Because we do things in certain ways. We make all sorts of basic assumptions without even thinking about it, because they're there in our culture, just as people did then. The only trouble is that the basic assumptions are quite different. So when we read things in the Bible, we can sometimes shudder a bit because we immediately put in assumptions which were never there in the original and equally fail to understand because there are assumption, assumptions in the original which we don't use in our culture and society. So all this business about the animals and, and, and the way this covenant was confirmed simply follows the ceremonial of the day. Think of any ceremony you like whether it's a church ceremony, some sort of secular ceremony, a procession with all sorts of overtones to it. Well, they wouldn't have necessarily been there in the originally, but they are there today. Think of a news bulletin. If, you, if the news bulletin refers to number 10, well, that means an awful lot to people in this country. What mean an awful lot to people in other countries? What's the significance of number 10? Number 10 what? Number 10 where? So this ceremony is one which would have been very meaningful and appropriate at the time, even if we find it strange at best and possibly cruel at worst. And of course, it worked. Abraham did have a descendant. I must admit, it wasn't all the members, numbers that uh, God promised that actually God, when he made the covenant, did uh, do that because it happened but over a much longer time scale. That's another problem we have with God. We tend to put our time scales on his work. So, it's, the only snag is it's a pity that Abraham's descendants, and that includes us by the way, weren't always very good at doing their bit in the covenant. Think about it. And note how Jesus coped with this. He didn't follow the culture of his day. He was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a Roman provincial capital. The Romans worked on the principle that they allowed local people throughout the empire to govern themselves as they wished internally but everything external was geared to Rome and they made jolly well sure that it was too. As far as religion was concerned you could worship any god you liked as many gods as you wished provided it included the Roman emperor as a god. That was much more of a salute the flag operation, actually, rather than a religious one. But you could see that it would have huge problems for Jewish people. And this is what caused the ongoing uh, difficulties between the Jews and the Romans. So Jesus didn't follow the culture of his day. He did things God's way. Well, that's not surprising, you may think. True, but it's not comfortable either. The Pharisees, a Jewish group, were humanly realistic. They saw the problems and they thought, well, we'll go along with them in order that we can do our bit and maintain our influence and our power. Jesus was divinely idealistic and that meant he concentrated on God first. Everything else came second. Note Jesus' attitude to Jerusalem when he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent you, how often 
I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, uh, but you were not willing. So why did all these things happen in Jerusalem? Why were things going wrong? Think of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Think of what they did when Jesus himself was brought before them. It was a more comfortable way out. It accommodated the Romans. It was realistic. The trouble is, it might have been realistic but it wasn't very honest. There was a lust for power, and that has been at the bottom of virtually every human problem, whether it be on a national scale, a global scale, or just an individual scale throughout history. We, or I, know best. But Jesus shows love and care. Think of the hen illustration. Again, perhaps a bit meaningless today. I don't doubt if many of us today have anything to do with keeping hens. We may have seen pictures on television of enormous sheds containing thousands of chickens or hens laying eggs. Many, very few of us will have the, that practical experience. I'm old enough to remember at the end of the, towards the end of the Second World War when uh, my father kept hens in our garden which was legal in wartime and apparently I am told you then got a, a ration of hen food instead of eggs a ration of eggs but nowadays we don't do this very often curiously my bungalow which was built in 1960 in its deeds to this day I am allowed to keep hens in my garden but I can't keep a caravan on the drive So there is also a danger of being unwilling, unwilling to accept God. Why? Do we see it as a sign of weakness? Well, I suppose if you think about Jesus' comments about the hen, about the hens, it is true that a hen house does not exactly have the kudos of a man's shed. Think about it. But this is what covenant is all about. One of the great gifts that the Methodist branch of the church has given to the church as a whole is the annual covenant service. And indeed, I certainly have come across an increasing number of people from other branches of the church who will come to a Methodist church for that annual covenant service. Remember? A covenant is a two-way agreement. And when we make that annual covenant, God always keeps his side because God is utterly and totally trustworthy and reliable. And us? In following God's covenant, what are we following? Are we following the idea, I am a lion, hear me roar, or I am a hen, see me gather? We need to keep our eyes open and not jump to human or divine conclusions. In the psalm, which was set for today, the last two verses are, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. God bless. And a big thanks uh, to 
Tony there. And interesting that uh, uh, he ended by emphasizing the closing verses, those last two verses of the psalm. And when I read them out, I felt that they were significant as I entered into this act of worship, uh, trust in the Lord and waiting on the Lord. So I hope you are encouraged. Uh, we are going to listen now as we continue in our reflections. Uh, we are going to um, remember the song, Lord, I come, I confess. And then following this, we'll join together in our prayers uh, for others. We're going to have a prayer for Ukraine. We're going to have one of the Methodist prayers of the day written by uh, Reverend Dr. Jonathan Pye, um, who's chair of the Bristol, Bristol District, that really encouraged me uh, as well as our as we go and face difficult times and we're aware of hostility and conflict across our world. But in the meantime, we listen to um, that great song, Lord, I come, I confess. And I think at its heart, this song is saying, I cannot do this discipleship on my own. I confess that I come to you for your um, strength. So yes, that's something that we can all own as we journey through Lent and are mindful of the challenge that uh, God has laid upon our hearts. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest without you. I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. When sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you
That was a lovely, wonderful song. I pray that you found that was uplifting. Lord, I need you. Lord, I come. I confess. As promised, we'll remember our prayers for others, but I thought it might be helpful for us to turn to the Methodist Church website. There is a prayer for uh, peace in Ukraine. And of course, I think it's most appropriate that we continue to pray in that vein. Please don't forget as well that all we can have set up a funding page uh, for those who wish to give towards uh, the needs in Ukraine. And uh, I'll just switch us across now and we can uh, just have a quick view of the Methodist Church website. Uh, so uh, here we are, um, prayer for priests in Ukraine. And I invite you to join uh, with me. Holy and gracious God, we pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and their leaders. We pray for all those who are afraid that your everlasting arms hold them in this great time of fear. We pray for those who have power over life and death that they will choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our swords into plowshares and seek peace. We pray for leaders on the world stage, that they are inspired by the wisdom and courage of Christ. Above all, Lord, today we pray for peace in Ukraine. We ask this in the name of your blessed Son. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Amen. And I would encourage you to pop some praying hands or an Amen in the comment section as we pray together. Then I was also struck by the prayer of today. This was actually um, placed on Monday, uh, but I was quite moved by this. It's the um, second prayer here. Jonathan Pye from the Brist Bristol District, as chair of Bristol District. I invite you to pray with me. God of all, whose love welcomes each person in a world where many feel they have no place, help us to remember that you offer a place for all, that no one is excluded from your love and that each has a home in your kingdom of justice and peace. When we are tempted to think ourselves more important than others, remind us of the special place you hold for people who are poor, weary, and dispossessed, and for those who are neglected, reviled, or unjustly treated. Help us to share in your righteous anger against all that harms our sisters and brothers, to rejoice in your all-encompassing love, and to see in our neighbour the face of Christ, who makes us one. Amen. And I turn to our Methodist worship book as we continue in our prayers. Uh, when I say, Lord, hear us, I invite you to respond, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. So we pray for the Church of God throughout the world. We pray for the Church, yes, in Ukraine. But we pray for the Church persecuted and the Church living in spaces of conflict. We pray for churches together in Britain and Ireland, particularly mindful of their theme for Churches Together October Prayer for this year. As we reflected on conflict in uh, Palestine. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us graciously hear us. We pray for those who have power and influence and for all who govern the nations that they would work together for the common good. We pray especially at this time of sanctions and questioning of how to prevent the conflict in Ukraine escalating. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the powerless, for all victims of famine and war, and for all who strive for justice and peace. 
and we remember those whose stories have not made the news headlines. The stories have been overshadowed by conflict in Ukraine. We remember those, Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And we pray for the afflicted and sorrowful and for all who need our prayers. And provided that you have their permission, if not, you may well want to use a different initial or a different name. It's helpful because it personalises somebody's situation. I'd invite you to offer a prayer context in, in the comment section. Uh, your prayers for those who are sick or troubled or grieving at this time. And we remember before God those who've passed from this life in faith and obedience and we give thanks for them. We remember their example, their loyalty, their steadfastness in the face of trials and tribulations. Lord, we thank you for our faith that has sustained the generations and sustains us today. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Eternal God, through the self-offering of your Son, you've filled our lives with your presence. Help us in our sufferings and trials and strengthen us in our weakness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let us say together the Lord's Prayer, as has become traditional in our live stream worship. I'll begin with by saying our Father, and we say the prayer together, and then I invite you, when you finish the prayer, uh, to leave me some praying hands in the comment section or say Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven. And we remember the peace today. In Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood, which was shed on the cross. So the peace of the Lord be with you this day. Now and always. Amen. Amen. close with a blessing for us all before we conclude with our final uh, hymn which is one thing remains the god of all grace who's called us to eternal glory in christ make us perfect confirming and strengthening us and to him be the power for ever and ever amen and the almighty and merciful god the father the son and the holy spirit Bless us and keep us now and always. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. It's been lovely to join with you folks. As I say, I'm here, I'm worshipping, and my understanding is that you will be joining me afterwards. You've joined me and uh, I wish you all the best uh, moving forward. Amen.
than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant through the trial and the change One thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails, never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, never gives up It never runs out on me